Malcolm Gladwell's 2000 book, The Tipping Point, centers on how ideas, products, messages, and behaviors spread throughout societies. They slowly build up momentum until they reach what he calls the tipping point, after which they rapidly become pervasive. The tipping point, he says, is the moment of critical mass, the threshold, the boiling point, after which change is inevitable. Mr. Conseco? I guess I'd say Mr. Schilling is correct about today's statistics on how many people are using steroids because we've made steroids aware. We've brought it out. When I mentioned the 80%, I mentioned at the peak of steroid use. That may have been somewhere from 94 on to the year 2000. That's when I played. Okay. I've been retired for, I guess, three or four years now. It's been a, it's been a long time. Because of certain instances that have, that have happened, definitely, it's definitely curtailed greatly. That was Jose Canseco testifying in 2005 before the House Government Reform Committee about steroids in baseball. Steroid usage and performance-enhancing drugs reached their tipping point in Major League Baseball during the 1994 strike. By 1996, there were 4,962 home runs hit, shattering the single-season record set in 1987 by more than 500 home runs. More players hit 20 home runs than in any other season to that point, and 17 players, including Ken Caminiti, hit 40 or more long balls, a record which still stands. The Baltimore Orioles lineup alone featured seven players who hit at least 20 home runs, a record which was just surpassed by the 2019 Minnesota Twins. Like the home run explosion in 1987, this raised eyebrows from sports writers and the general public. Something was clearly amiss in the game of baseball. The articles that had begun popping up in 1995 about baseball's growing steroids problem began to multiply. Speculation came from within the game as well. Players such as Chicago White Sox superstar Frank Thomas and San Diego Padres legend Tony Gwynn went on the record with Bob Nightingale of the Los Angeles Times in 1995, saying that they wanted steroid testing in baseball. San Diego general manager Randy Smith speculated that 10 to 20 percent of players were using performance-enhancing drugs at that point. While acting commissioner Bud Selig maintained, if baseball has a problem, we are not aware of it. It was Tony Gwynn who looked into his crystal ball and saw the future with his comments to Nightingale. He said, It's like the big secret we're not supposed to talk about. But believe me, we wonder just like the rest of people. I'm standing out there in the outfield when a guy comes up and I'm thinking, Hey, I wonder if this guy's on steroids. I think we all have our suspicions who's on the stuff. But unless someone comes out and admits to it, who will ever know for sure? To find the person who eventually would come out and admit to it, all Tony Gwynn had to do was look across the Padres' locker room. This is Secondary Lead, The Rise and Fall of Ken Caminiti, a 10-part series on the life and career of one of the most important baseball players of the 80s and 90s. If you like this show, please click subscribe and leave a rating or review. And now, Chapter 7, The Tipping Point. After the dramatic conclusion to the 1996 season was followed by a quick exit in the playoffs, Ken Caminiti had surgery to repair his torn rotator cuff on October 9th. The damage was extensive. He suffered from a torn labrum, a torn bicep tendon, torn cartilage, and bone spurs. Padres team doctor Jan Fronick told the media that he estimated the rehab process would take five to nine months, which meant a best case scenario was that Cami would be back for opening day but he might not be ready until the All-Star break. Fronick said he believed the tear developed gradually over the last two to three years and had been discovered in an MRI at the beginning of the season. The play in the Astrodome was the final push that the injury needed to go over the top in its severity. Ken stayed optimistic throughout the rehab process, telling those at a Padres Awards luncheon in December that he was expecting to be ready for the start of the season. His shoulder was recovering quickly, and while it was weak, he said it was seeing some good gains. It's not surprising that his shoulder was recovering fast with the help of anabolic steroids. In the X chromosome, DNA has what are called androgen receptors, or ARs for short. ARs are proteins that sense and bind to androgenic hormones, mainly testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. 
These ARs mostly cannot tell the difference between testosterone that the body naturally produces and a fake testosterone, such as anabolic steroids. These ARs play a key factor in stimulating muscle growth. When you inject yourself with synthetic testosterone, these ARs kick into overdrive and you experience great muscle growth. What's more, ARs are found in particularly high concentrations in the shoulders and traps, which is why those muscle groups are impacted first and more significantly when someone uses steroids. The high concentration in ARs allowed for the kind of growth to be stimulated which let Caminiti's shoulder heal faster. Of course, steroid use is not without profound consequences on the body's long-term health. The hyperstimulation can make your body start building muscle too fast. After his playing career, Caminiti said, I got really strong really quick. My muscles got too strong for my tendons and ligaments. At the end of the 1996 season, Ken went off steroids, but the damage was already done by his reckless use, during which he injected twice the amount of drugs as would be considered normal for a ball player. Doctors found that his body had virtually stopped producing its own testosterone, and that his T levels were 20% of what would be considered normal for a male of his age. As steroids were exploding around the game of baseball, so was a new culture of fitness in the game. Weightlifting was traditionally considered bad for ball players. That began to change in the late 80s and early 90s and correlated with the widespread introduction of steroids into the game. Steroids work in building muscle, but only if you put in the work in the gym. Teams lifted weights, had advanced nutritional programs, and even brought in mental skills coaches to give their players an edge that was never seen before. By the mid-90s, a significant number of baseball players had began to transform into Hulk-like figures, mashing baseballs and hurling fastballs like never seen before. Articles popped up talking about baseball's new weightlifting culture and an over-the-counter substance called creatine, which was new at the time, but popular among lifters. To this day, creatine, which the body naturally produces in small amounts, is a staple supplement in the fitness community. A paper published by the National Institutes of Health concluded that well-controlled studies on the adverse effects of exogenous creatine supplementation are almost non-existent. In layman's terms, there are no side effects to creatine, and it has numerous positive benefits. Many of the articles written about creatine cited players we now know use steroids as creatine users. Mark McGuire, Juan Gonzalez, Jason Giambi, and Ken Caminiti notably. But not all creatine users and big lifters in the 90s were on steroids. This was the changing culture of the game. The San Diego Padres were so into lifting as a team that in 1996, Bob Tewksbury designed a t-shirt for the team with a gorilla bench pressing a barbell on the front. The bar was bending for the amount of weight on either side. It was Brad Osmus who came up with a famous slogan for the back of the shirt. We were trying to come up with a saying of like, what could go on the back of the shirt and, and, and this and that. And then Brad, who is our uh, Dartmouth Brad, he comes up and he's, he's like, he goes, how about this? Who needs to hit 300 when you can bench 300? <laughs> which we thought was kind of catchy. And uh, so we put those on the back of the shirts. I remember we did that, but I can't tell you what the, there obviously was some backstory, but I can't, I don't remember what it was. Scott Livingstone got a shirt for reaching the 300 pound bench club, as did Osmus, who could bench north of 325 pounds. Livingstone recalls during the 1996 season that Caminiti, torn rotator cuff and all, benched 365 pounds. While bench press is mainly a chest exercise, you do rely on your rotator cuff muscles to help move the bar. That he was able to do that was nothing short of amazing. The ESPY award goes to... Ken Caminiti. In February, Ken traveled to Radio City Music Hall in New York City for the 1997 ESPY awards. Actors Scott Bakula and supermodel Tyra Banks presented him with the Outstanding Baseball Performer of the Year Award, and he took home a second SB for Outstanding Baseball Play of the Year for throwing out Greg Colburn from his rear end. Here's a part of Ken's SB acceptance speech, during which he also thanked his trainer, Blake Blackwell. Most of all, I'd like to thank my, my family and my wife, Nancy, who couldn't be here tonight. We just had a baby girl. and. I'd like to say hello to my, my other two girls, Kendall and Lindsay. Daddy did good. Thank you. 
After getting his espies, Ken walked to the lobby bar and asked the bartender to make him a vodka drink that could be disguised as ice water. His agent at the time, Alex Katz, was attending the ceremony with him, and he surely wanted to hide it from him. He was only planning on having one, but he later told a reporter, I drank about a hundred of them. Even though Ken had relapsed when he began his steroid usage, he was now firmly off the wagon. On the diamond, the 1997 San Diego Padres had high hopes. The media agreed that the biggest key for the Padres was Caminiti's health coming back from surgery. But with all the offseason hullabaloo about a June or July timetable, in February, Ken was taking his hacks in the batting cages at spring training. Here's Ken on a San Diego newscast. I feel like a nerd. I mean, it just doesn't feel comfortable, but for being the first day and swinging left-handed, I, I felt real good and, and I, I didn't have any pain. Caminiti was in the Padres' opening day lineup, but got off to a slow start. By the end of May, he was hitting just 235 with only four home runs and 22 RBIs, all far cries from his 1996 numbers. He missed two weeks when he went on the disabled list on May 12th with a right hamstring strain. That was one of five hamstring strains Caminiti would suffer in 1997 as he tried his best to play through the pain. According to the story he told Sports Illustrated in 2002, Ken decided with his early season struggles to begin using steroids again. This time, instead of driving to Mexico, Caminiti enlisted a friend in California to help him get the drugs. This friend taught him how to use steroids and how to use them properly in cycles, periods of use and rest, each usually about six weeks long. I felt like a kid. I'd be running the bases and think, man, I'm fast. And I never been fast. Steroids made me feel like that. The stronger you get, the more relaxed you get. You feel good. You just let it fly. There's a mental edge that comes with the injections, and it's definitely something that gets you more intense. The thing is, I didn't do it to make me a better ball player. I did it because my body broke down. As Caminiti scuffled at the start of 1997, so did the Padres, who spent much of the early season in last place. The San Diego offense was largely good, but their pitching was atrocious. The staff ERA for the season was 4.98, and of the 21 pitchers used by the Padres during the season, only Trevor Hoffman had an ERA below 3.6. During the offseason, Kevin Towers had tried to improve the staff, when he purchased the contract of Hideki Arabu from the Chiba Lotte Marines of the Japanese Pacific League. The flamethrowing righty was nicknamed the Nolan Ryan of Japan, but he refused to sign a contract with San Diego, saying he only wanted to play for the Yankees. He was eventually traded to New York in a blockbuster deal which sent top Yankees prospect Ruben Rivera to the Padres. Towers tried to shore up the staff in mid-June, when he traded Livingstone, Phil Plantier, and Fernando Valenzuela to St. Louis for pitchers Rich Batchelor, Danny Jackson, and outfielder Mark Sweeney, who remembers his first impression of meeting Ken Caminiti. I met up with the team in uh, Texas. We were playing interleague at the time. And unfortunately for me, Caminiti was hurt at the time. He hurt his hamstring in that particular game, my first game. We eventually went back to San Diego and he was wrapped up and uh, his hamstring was wrapped up to a point where he slid on his uniform for that game. But uh, basically he was just putting the shell of the uniform on just to be present. Um, and that showed a lot for me. That was my first kind of impression. I'm saying, hey man, this guy's, uh, he's got it going on. He's got that, I don't know, that Marlboro man feel to him back in the day, the brawny type guy. So anyway, we go through the game and Arky Cianfranco, who was his backup, was playing that time, that day. He gets one off his thumb and right in the middle of the game, gets a pitch off his thumb and all of a sudden in the old San Diego Stadium, we had to run up the tunnel, the football stadium mm -hmm. at, at Qualcomm, but we had to run up a, a, a walkway to the locker room. So I'm trying to run up to try to you know get loose. I had no idea what was gonna happen, how many moves, so I was just getting ready. And all of a sudden I look up and it's Ken Caminetti trying to do like uh, little uh, knee, knee bends and step ups and things like that. And he's pumping his, his legs. I'm like, what are you doing? And I, I, had, I mean, I was fearful because I was new. I said, what are you doing, man? And he goes, I want to see what I got. And the reason why I tell you that is that was my first impression of him and my first kind of interaction with him. And I'm like, man, this guy, 
he's got something going. There's an it factor to that. Not only is he a spectacular player, but he's got that drive that I just want to be out there for my club. For the third straight season, Caminiti finished red hot. After June 1st, he hit 311 with 22 home runs and 68 RBIs in his final 101 games of the year. For the third time in his career, he was named a National League All-Star and won the Gold Glove Award at third base. He did that despite missing games for his hamstring troubles, turf toe, lower back spasms, a neck strain, and while toughing out patellar tendon tears which required off-season knee surgery. The Padres scuffled to a 76-86 finish, last in the National League West. Despite having the second-best offense in the NL, the Padres sported the worst pitching staff in the league. It was a disappointing finish, and massive changes were needed for 1998. Teammates and coaches had noticed Caminiti becoming more withdrawn and moody in the clubhouse in 1997. This was a sign that his mental state was not good. After the season, he began attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings again for the first time in two years. He sought help and for a time was committed to sticking with it. After his knee surgery in October, he was offered painkillers by doctors, but he refused to take them, at least according to an article in ESPN the magazine in 1998. But that wasn't the only thing weighing on Caminiti's mind. Ken wanted to stay in San Diego and still had his option year for 1998 remaining on the contract he had signed two years prior. Before the 97 season began, he expressed interest in a long-term extension, but that went nowhere. The Padres offered the reigning National League MVP a two-year, $10 million extension through the 2000 season. Caminiti's camp sought a three-year, $21 million extension a difference of one year and $2 million a season. Ken had made three all-star teams, won three Gold Glove awards, and was named the MVP in the past four seasons, and he wanted to be paid like the elite player he had become. The two sides never came to an agreement, and talks of an extension were never mentioned in the media after April. Meanwhile, Kevin Towers went on a spending spree to fix the Padres heading into 1998. He pulled off trades to acquire Brian Boehringer, Dan Maselli, and Donnie Wall for the bullpen, and signed Mark Langston as a free agent starting pitcher. The biggest splash of the offseason came in December, when the Padres acquired Kevin Brown from the World Series champion Florida Marlins for three players. The Marlins and owner Wayne Huizenga had went on a spending spree heading into 1997, and it paid out with a World Series. After the season, Huizenga tore the team down piece by piece, trading Brown to San Diego in just one of a dizzying series of transactions that offseason for the Marlins. The team was virtually unrecognizable heading into 1998. That season was a pivotal year for the San Diego Padres as well. Tony Gwynn was in his age 38 season. Caminiti, Steve Finley, Wally Joyner, and Kevin Brown were all set to be free agents at the end of the year, and John Morse was pushing for a vote to approve public funds to build a new baseball stadium in San Diego. Qualcomm Stadium was opened in the late 60s, and as a wave of new ballparks opened across Major League Baseball in the 90s, Qualcomm's cookie-cutter, multi-purpose design was out of vogue and the facilities were obsolete. A lot of that was owing to Padres president Larry Lucchino, who had the vision to build Camden Yards, the first of the modern baseball-exclusive ballparks during his time in Baltimore. But the Padres faced some resistance. In order to placate the San Diego Chargers' desire to host a Super Bowl, the city pushed through measures that were unpopular with citizens and created a public relations headache. Nonetheless, a vote for a new Padres ballpark was planned for November 3rd. If the team could whip up enough public support with a good season, there was a good chance the vote would pass. It was a formula that worked well for the 1995 Seattle Mariners, and the Padres were eager to recreate that. Even so, a well-timed media leak that Moores was considering selling the team to an ownership group from Northern Virginia didn't hurt either. This was common in the 1990s. Under Bud Selig's leadership, MLB teams made a push to build new taxpayer-funded stadiums. Since 1992, more than three quarters of MLB stadiums have either been completely rebuilt or undertaken massive renovations. In most cases, especially in small markets, MLB has threatened to relocate teams if money for a new stadium was not approved. As the Padres juiced their payroll to make a run at a championship in 1998, excitement swirled around the team's hopes. 
pundits took note of Kevin Towers and John Moore's commitment to winning, and San Diego was widely considered the favorite to win the NL West, which was now a five-team division with the Arizona Diamondbacks joining as an expansion team. There was rampant speculation that if the Padres couldn't pull off a pennant, this would be it for the team in San Diego. With a looming stadium vote, threats of relocation, and an impending free agent exodus, the competitive window was set to slam shut. We got to spring training, and that's where you cultivate all of the new pieces. And instantly, we had a connection, and it was a lot of different personalities. If you went down the roster you'd, and you knew the different personalities, you were like, wow, I mean, I wonder how that's going to come together. Spring training, it did. Uh, we just felt like uh, we had something and we had the ability to go out, attack the Los Angeles Dodgers uh, in our own division, have the ability to go out there and win our division. Uh, it, it was just like a self-belief, but we had to go out there and prove it. And we did. Also juiced that season was Caminiti. He showed up to spring training as big as an ox and was determined to return to his 1996 form. As early as March, articles popped up speculating about what teams would be interested in Ken as a free agent at the end of the season. The New York Yankees were said to want him to replace Scott Brocious at third base. If it was early in my career, I'd probably be a little timid about New York, Caminiti said during spring training, referring to the demanding New York fans and media. During spring training, there was an extraordinary incident at Peoria Stadium. One day, a fan was heckling Caminiti, and the taunts turned extremely personal. After he was done playing in that day's game, Ken changed into a blue t-shirt and shorts and sat down in the stands with the man. They talked for a while, and Ken even asked him why he was heckling. I told him that I wouldn't come to his job and yell those things at him, Caminiti told reporters. He signed autographs for fans, and when he got up to leave, Ken was cheered. This is a revealing episode. Even as he had the well-established reputation as a tough guy and a warrior, Ken was still very sensitive. He was vulnerable to insults, and this fan, on this day, hit a nerve. There was once a time where players entered the stands and beat up hecklers, and here was Caminiti taking time to empathetically approach one. Padres first baseman Wally Joyner always maintained he was not a power hitter. He slugged 22 home runs as a rookie in 1986 and 34 the next year for the California Angels, but he hit only more than 16 in a season one other time in his 16-year career. He hit lots of doubles and was a career 289 hitter and is one of the more underrated players of the steroid era, perhaps because he was not a big home run hitter. On the same day that Caminiti had his knee surgery after the 1997 season, Joyner underwent the exact same procedure on his right knee. Despite being around the same age, Ken recovered much faster, and Wally knew that steroids were the reason. Looking to recover from injuries faster and fight the decline of his career, Joyner approached Caminiti after a workout one day in spring training and asked where he can get steroids. Ken gave Wally the phone number of his supplier. Joyner called the man and talked to him for a short time. The next day in the clubhouse, Caminiti handed Joyner an overnight shipping envelope. Inside the package was a small bottle filled with pills. Ken instructed Wally on how to take the pills. Joyner took three in a 10-day period before he decided that steroids weren't for him. He took the remainder of the bottle, emptied it into the toilet, and flushed the pills. San Diego lived up to the hype in 1998. They took over first place in the NL West six games into the season and stayed there for the rest of the year with the exception of four days in early June. They went 98-64 and to win the division by nine and a half games over San Francisco. Led by Greg Vaughn's 50 home runs, the Padres left no doubt of their superiority in the West that year. But for Ken, the season was a struggle. He turned 35 on April 21st exactly one week after having to miss a game with lower back spasms. His back problems persisted the entire season, and he missed games on six separate occasions because of back spasms. Caminiti strained his left quadriceps muscle in May and was put on the disabled list despite his protests. He also sat out a game in July with a strained ribcage. Ken's batting average hovered in the 240s, 
before his summer hot streak pushed it up to 286 in July after a three home run game against the Dodgers. But that was the high water mark for Ken. Hobbled by injuries, Caminiti struggled in September especially, batting just 177 in the final month of the year with only two home runs and three RBIs. Ken hit just 252 on the season, his worst batting average since 1991, and his 862 OPS was still very good, but was his lowest since 1994. There were times that you knew he wasn't 100% and maybe our team might have been better with somebody that was a little more healthy, but he wouldn't let that. It, it, was, it was the way he drove himself. Caminiti had struggles in 1998 that went beyond his injuries and on the field problems. Having relapsed in his recovery, it was clear to his teammates and manager that something was going on. They could see a change in his temperament, his mood swings, and in his eyes. Bruce Bochy confronted him, and Ken said he was fine. Years later, with some hindsight, Kevin Towers remembered, I started to get a little sense of something toward the end of 1998. His mood wasn't the same. He was a little more aloof and standoffish. He was a very private person, so he would sit at his locker some days. The next day, he'd be pulling up a chair next to you and, you know, while you just getting there at the stadium and he's he's chatting it up. So it was uh, very volatile when it came to um, his personality day by day. Here's Merv Rettmond. I would say this, I was very close to him the year he was the MVP. A year later, he, he was just, uh, it wasn't, nothing was the same. But he, I would say that I got along with him probably as well as any player I ever coached. Part of the shift in mood may have come from San Diego beginning to show their intentions of not making a concerted effort to re-sign Caminiti and his brewing friction with Larry Lucchino. Tom Krasovic, a Padres beat writer for the San Diego Union Tribune at the time, remembers him being especially hurt by that. Krasovic remembered, there was a quote from him like, they're going to put me out in a field and shoot me. He would say these quotes with a lot of emotion in his eyes. I know it sounds melodramatic, but he was really wounded. Richard Justice is a national baseball writer for MLB.com. He was he was a sensitive person. He was known as as this gung ho balls out player, um, and you could see how I mean he would take things personally. You know when you say you know it's easy to say hey buddy that's just business. It wasn't just business to him. I, I think he. Obviously, you look at the way he played, he poured his heart and soul into it. And so if if he felt, you know, he wasn't being treated fairly, and fairly means a million different things in, in, in this world, um, yeah, he would be hurt by it. Hmm. He'd be mad by it, too. Regarding Larry, there was part of him that was angry, but there was part of him that was just hurt. You know, I have a, I have a, I have a bar here for the way I treat people. And I would like to think you had that same bar. Addiction and distance was putting a strain on Caminiti's career and home life with Nancy and his three daughters. In the offseason, Ken still made his home in the Houston area, where his older daughters were enrolled in school. He said that if he could get a long-term extension done with the Padres, he would move his family to San Diego full-time. But that never materialized. That kind of distancing is part of what makes it difficult to be the family member of a professional athlete. Adding in the additional strain of a relapse only makes the pressure greater. One has to wonder how differently things might have turned out for Caminiti if the extension in San Diego had worked out. The Padres won the hearts of San Diego in 1998, but now turn their eyes toward the World Series. They knew in all likelihood that the New York Yankees, who had won an astonishing 114 games during the regular season, would be waiting for them as the American League representative in the Fall Classic. San Diego dispatched Houston in four games in the National League Division Series, but Caminiti didn't do much. He managed two hits in 14 at-bats as the Padres advanced for a date with the Atlanta Braves in the National League Championship Series. Game one was at Turner Field in Atlanta, and Cammy's body was failing him. In the bottom of the ninth, with San Diego leading 2-1, the Braves' Ryan Klesko made a daring base-running maneuver when he tried to go first to third on a single to left field. Ruben Rivera's throw was at the bag in plenty of time, but Caminiti dropped the ball and Klesko was safe. The next batter, Andrew Jones lifted a sacrifice fly to tie the game and hand Trevor Hoffman a blown save. In the top of the tenth, 
Ken was due up second against Atlanta reliever Kerry Leitenberg. With one out and the bases empty, Ken was ahead in the count three balls and one strike when he performed a superhuman feat of redemption. One out, nobody on, and Caminiti into center field. Andrew Jones back at the track at the wall. Caminiti to put the Padres on top, 3-2 in the 10th. The aging warrior, paying the price for decades of abusing his body for the good of the team, came through in the biggest way, and the Padres' dugout erupted in joy. After struggling down the stretch, hitting a game-winning home run in the playoffs added another layer to the legend of Ken Caminiti. San Diego held off Atlanta and won the National League Championship Series in six games. The dream run came to an end with the 1998 World Series. The mighty New York Yankees swept the Padres in four games, and Caminiti's performance was notably bad. He had just two hits and 14 at-bats, made two errors on the field, and on more than one occasion fell down as he swung and missed at pitches. Legendary Yankees closer Mariano Rivera made it a point to pitch Caminiti inside because it looked like he was having trouble standing up. Willie Mays struggling to catch fly balls in the 1973 World Series is a go-to reference for a superstar struggling on the big stage at the end of his career, but Caminiti in the 1998 World Series experienced a similar fate. We, had, we got to the World Series, we had seven out of the nine starters injured. And they weren't going to get better. But the point is, they played every day and no one said a word. And it was a shame, the World Series. He was That was a not... He couldn't hardly move. <coughs> that was really bad. Mm -hmm. and the, I don't know if it was the second game. I think it was the second game. They had a ball to him in the first inning. He, bent him, he couldn't get up. <laughs> he, I mean, he was hurting. You know, it, was, it was something every day. In Game 3, Caminiti fouled a ball off his knee so hard that his leg felt numb and it took nearly two hours after the game for him to receive treatment and get dressed. This was the same game in which he fell over twice while swinging and missing, and in which Yankees third baseman Scott Brocious hit two home runs. Brocious was named World Series MVP and was re-signed by the Yankees after the season. And Ken Caminiti headed forward into free agency with more questions about his future than answers. Testing the waters of free agency for the first time, three suitors emerged to sign Caminiti for 1999. The Detroit Tigers, led by former Padres GM Randy Smith, the Houston Astros, where Craig Biggio was lobbying the team to re-sign Cami, and the San Diego Padres. Ken maintained that he wanted to stay in San Diego, but was growing increasingly disappointed that they didn't seem to want to keep him. On November 3rd, San Diegans voted to approve a new stadium for the Padres, Two weeks later, the first domino fell in the team's dismantling. Caminiti signed a two-year, $9.5 million deal with the Houston Astros, with a team option for 2001. Ken turned down more money in the form of a three-year, $21.5 million deal from Detroit and a contract with San Diego worth around $3 million per year to return home and be closer to his family. His departure began an exodus from San Diego. Wally Joyner re-upped for the 99 season, but Kevin Brown signed with the Los Angeles Dodgers on December 12th for a record $105 million. Six days later, Steve Finley signed with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Coming off his 50 home run season, Greg Vaughn was traded to Cincinnati for Reggie Sanders. Once tapped to replace Ken Caminiti at third base in Houston, the Padres signed Phil Nevin to replace Caminiti at third base in San Diego. Only three starting players remained on the team for the 1999 season, and the Padres sunk to 74-88. and 88. They would not have a winning season again until 2004, and failed to make the playoffs again until 2005. Despite raising some eyebrows from the players' union for his decision, Caminiti was headed to another contender, where he was reunited with friends Craig Biggio and Jeff Bagwell. He was excited at the prospect of spending more time at home with his wife and daughters. Baseball is a strange life on a family, Caminiti told the Associated Press. I think happiness is being with my family, my kids, and my wife. But going back to Houston was the worst thing he could have done. On the next episode of Secondary Lead, the rise and fall of Ken Caminiti. Ken's return to Houston is marked by injuries and renewed tensions with team ownership. He struggles through one final season in baseball, 
and Ken's post-career spiral begins. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast and leave a rating or review, and spread the word by telling a friend. Follow us at Secondary Lead on Twitter and Instagram. Like our Facebook page and check out show extras on YouTube. Music is courtesy of PurplePlanet.com and the YouTube Audio Library. Our theme was written and performed by Jim Montgomery and Chris Cottrell. I'm your host, Joe Vasile. Thanks for listening.